And let's see, the first, first place we'll go out of there, let's just go, go ahead and turn to 1 Samuel 13. Let's save a little bit of time. 1 Samuel 13. And then Hebrews 11. Appreciate the songs Brother Jim picked out tonight. I think it fits very well with the character that we're studying next out of Hebrews 11. Of course, this has been uh, for some time now looking at the, uh, the chapter of Hebrews chapter 11, the, the hall of faith, if you will. Uh, many examples of great men and women and what they did by faith. And uh, how their faith produced an action in their life. And of course, we looked at James chapter 2 starting out this, this whole series about how our faith should produce works. And uh, that ought to be evidenced in the lives of a Christian. And, you know, the, the saying, it may be a little cliche, but it's, it's a very true saying that if we were to be put on trial for being a Christian, would there be enough evidence there to convict us? Would we be found guilty? And then I would go ahead and say it this way. I heard someone uh, mention this not too long ago, but the question was, I think I might have preached this here a couple of years ago, I don't remember, but the question was this, concerning our church and, and the faith that we say we have and what works we're doing. The, the question was this, it said, if everybody in my church was just like me, what kind of church would it be? And that's a pretty sobering question. Because sometimes it's real easy to sit back and just think, well, somebody else take care of that. <laughs> uh, you know, that's, that's not my job, and so I'm not going to... You know, our, our faith ought to produce an action no matter whether it's our job or not. Amen. <laughs> it really should. Look, our faith ought to be so full in our lives that we ought to be doing things for the cause of Jesus Christ, really whether or not we've been asked to do it by somebody else or not. Because the Lord's asked us to do plenty. There's plenty on our plate from this Bible of what he expects of a New Testament Christian. And so the question tonight is this, as we're studying faith in action, and we're going to look tonight at David. And we're not even going to do it justice in in the time we have to do this. It it would take uh, probably close to six months, eight months, nine months, something like that, to really cover in depth David's life. And of course, we've been preaching on 1 Samuel and 2 Samuel since I took over three years ago. And we're just in chapter 5 of 2 Samuel. And so we're going to rehash some of that tonight. But David is is a unique character because most of the folks in Hebrews chapter 11, besides maybe Moses, uh, they didn't really live a life of faith. They had certain instances that were recorded. But David, from the time he is mentioned... All the way through, you can trace the actions by faith in his life all the way through there. Now, there's a few stumbling points. We'll talk about that tonight, too. Nobody, no man's perfect. We understand that. And I appreciate God putting their faults and their flaws in there so we can take heed to that and not make the same mistakes. But David truly, I believe, lived a life of faith. And, of course, the only example that supersedes all of that is the life of Jesus Christ from day one. And so tonight, Hebrews eleven thirty two, we know the Bible says, And what more shall I say? For the time would fail me to tell of Gideon, and of Barak, and of Samson, and of Jephthah. Those are all judges, as we've seen all in the book of Judges. And of David also. And of course, we'll look then next at Samuel and of the prophets. But tonight, we're looking at David's life of faith. And I think we could take the words right out of Hebrews eleven thirty two. The time would certainly fail us to discuss in detail David's full life and all the things that he did. So we're just going to kind of hit the high points tonight and looking at, at his life of faith. And I think there's, like I said, there's only a handful of folks you could say that about. Moses definitely one of them. Samuel's one of them. Right? From, from the moment Samuel was born, God had a purpose for his life. And his, and his mom, Hannah, there, she put him right back into the ministry and fulfilled her vow. We talked about vows last week. But she fulfilled her vow, putting Samuel back into the ministry. And, of course, the boy Samuel, the Bible says, grew in favor with God and man. And, of course, as he grew, God used him in a great way. And I think Samuel's life, obviously, is a life of faith there. Uh, David, of course. Uh, Daniel. Daniel would be another one. Really, from, you know, even though Daniel was put into captivity 
from day one, as far as we know, Daniel was, was taught the things of God. He was uh, not necessarily a Christian home, but a godly home certainly brought up in. And for him to go and stand before uh, a foreign king in captivity and, and do what he did and take the stance that he did, certainly somebody taught him something about God in, in his former life. And so I think Daniel, we could put in that. Uh, you could put, put Paul in there. You know, you say, well, Paul persecuted the church. Yeah, but he thought he was doing right. I mean, he, he was doing the best he could do, right? <laughs> And God showed him a more perfect way, and he, he, took that, he took that correction, took that direction, and went on for God. I think we could say Paul probably lived the life of faith, and of course Jesus, the whole way. And you know, the Bible talks so much about the faith of Christ. And because of his faithfulness, you and I get part of that as we're born again, because he was faithful to God. And therefore, you know, you look at the humanity of Christ. <laughs> In the garden, he said, Lord, not my will, but thine be done. But if, if you could take this cup away from me, I'd really appreciate it. <laughs> but God didn't. And so he remained faithful to his father's will. He remained faithful to his father's work, even though it cost him his life. So as we look at the life of faith from day one, I think it's so important. You know, we've got a a great little bumper crop of munchkins running around here. Man, it's a blessing. Another one on the way. Amen. And maybe some more on the way. It's, It's giggle time now, Brother Mike. You need to talk to some of these people. Tell them it's okay to have seven kids, amen. Yeah. <laughs> but I listen, I, I, we, we have such a wonderful opportunity to influence these young people and to teach them the things of God. Teach them the Bible. To teach them about Jesus. And of course, the first step in their life is going to be their salvation. But hey, listen, listen. It's, and it's great. See people saved. We ought to want to do that. We ought to get out there and do that. We ought to be witnessing. I, I appreciate every Sunday that we can. We're out there knocking doors. I appreciate that. That is what we need to be doing as a church. But I'm telling you, you can't neglect the ones that are in this church either. Because that group that comes along is going to be the next group that's sitting here if the Lord tears his coming 70 years. And one of them might be standing in my place. So the influence that we have upon them is of utmost importance. And yes, the church has a big part of that, but that really falls on the home. That's mom and dad. If you go back to 1 Samuel chapter 13, I'm telling you before David ever came on the scene, Jesse and Mama Jesse, (laughs) they were doing something right at home. 1 Samuel 13 This is after Saul is sacrificed and he shouldn't have. Verse 14, the Bible says this. Well, look at verse 13. Samuel said to Saul, Thou son foolishly, thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. Remember Sunday night we talked about how God established David's kingdom and how God gave him favor for his glory and for his work. But see, Saul never passed the test. God gave Saul one little command. Actually, Samuel gave it. Nonetheless, wait for me. <laughs> and he waited till the seventh day. And he said, Samuel's not coming. And, and you know, it's just the way, way God works. As soon as we think he's not going to do it, we step out on our own. And here, here he comes. Here's what would have happened. And so as soon as he sacrifices, Samuel shows up and says, what, what are you doing? Well, I didn't think you were coming. <laughs> And so here the Lord said, Thou hast not kept the commandment of thy God. Verse 14, Now thy kingdom shall not continue. But the Lord has sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him. See, I, I think God already knew he was going to pick David right there. So I, don't, I don't agree with that. Well, that's okay. When you, preach, you can preach how you want to. I think God already picked I think God already saw David's heart. Right here in 1 Samuel 13. And he said, that young man is after my heart. And as he's saying this to Saul, he's saying, The Lord has sought after his own heart. The Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And so what you've got going on is you've got Saul, who's been set up as the king. He's not obeying God. And then you've got David. You don't even know where David's at until chapter 17. You don't even know what he's been doing. Till chapter 17. But God knew what he was doing in chapter 13. God saw him over there tending his daddy's sheep. Oh, we teach that obedience, don't we? That little song, O B E D I E N C E, right? Obedience is the very best way. Anybody know how it ends? 
to show that you believe. How about that? Faith in action. So he gets taught this age. And, and I think, I think here, here Jesse came to David and said, David, I need you to go keep the sheep today. And I don't think he said, Dad, but I want to play my iPad. <laughs> he didn't say, but Dad, I want to stay home. And do this. He said, yes, sir, Dad. And he picked up his shepherd's stick. He picked up whatever he had to take out there. And he went out there and he took care of the sheep. And you know what? God saw that. God said, well, that's pretty good. And then here comes the lion. Right? Remember David tells Saul, Lord, help me kill a lion and a bear with my bare hands. Remember that? So here comes the lion. And David said, Lord, I need your help. <laughs> Something was going on in David's home where his mom and dad were teaching him about God, about the goodness of God, about the ability of God. And so David, even as a ruddy youth, he's called in chapter 17, even as a ruddy youth, he is exhibiting more faith and more obedience to God than the grown man King Saul. And when God sees Saul's disobedience, he sees David, he said, look, I'm done with you. I've got a man that's after my own heart. And he's going to be my captain. And he's going to lead my, my people, Israel. God could already trust David more than he could trust Saul. But what happened? That was just simply David being obedient to mom and dad. And no kids in here tonight. But hey, adults, how are we doing on that obedience training? Speak to the young families here for a second. Do this. No. <laughs> okay, how does that get taken care of? Because listen, if they, if they say no to you, they're going to say no to God. Right? So faith in action. I'm not training them so I can lord over them. I'm training them to have a relationship with me so that they can have a relationship with God that pleases God. Honor thy father and thy mother. Children, obey your parents and the Lord for this is right. It all starts at three and, two and three and four years old. I don't think anybody in here would raise your hand and say, I want my kid to be the next dope drug dealer in Lebanon, Virginia. I don't think anybody in here would say, I want my kid to be the next meth seller on the street. I don't think anybody in here would say, I want my next daughter to be the next prostitute. Nobody would ever say that. But you know what? Where all that stuff starts is at two and three years old. And if, the, if it's not fixed and corrected and trained at that age, it will not mature and it will not show itself at 13, 23, and 33. So David's life of faith began before he even knew what God was going to do with him. David's life of faith began with his mom and dad. That's pretty good stuff. Come over to 1 Samuel 17. I mean, just let your mind wonder, what were, the, what were the young childhood, teenage days of David like? We don't know how old he was when he came to, uh, to chapter 17, to the, the field with Goliath. But the Bible says he was a ruddy youth, so, so either he's in his teens or, I, I don't know, I have no idea. But what was David doing at four, five, six years old? I think his mom and dad were training him to trust God. And as that lion came, listen, as that lion came, I, I, by his testimony, the Lord helped me. By his testimony, he's saying, God, you've got to help me. When the bear came, Lord, you've got to help me. And I think, I think David, you know, God said he, he saw him a man after his own heart. I, I think David, well, we've talked about what it means to be after God's heart, about how, how we want to please God. But also how that, that heart after, it's a copy of, it's, it's, a, it's a characteristic, a representative of God's heart. And I think David's sitting out there in the field watching those sheep. And you know, he's got that harp out there and he's, he's playing those songs. Just, just singing, singing to God. He's out there and he's, he's throwing that slingshot at pieces of grass. <laughs> Clipping them off at 60 yards, you know. He's not just sitting out there daydreaming. And God saw that. And God said, I can use that boy. Chapter 17, I think really, you know, people study that and they preach that and they come to this chapter and talk about what great faith David had. Listen, David stepping out onto that battlefield was just another walk in the park with him and God. He walks in there and he hears that Philistine defying God and he says, are you guys not going to take care of this guy? <laughs> Why has somebody not walked out there? And by the way, we've talked about all this. Saul should have been the man out there. He was head and shoulders above everybody else. Right. And so David, 
What's going on? Why, why is nobody down there taking care of that guy? Because, you know, none of those guys in that army had ever killed a bear with their bare hands with the help of God. None of them had ever killed a lion with their bare hands with the help of God. They hadn't been practicing with a slingshot. And why is nobody taking care of that guy? Well, I mean, if you want to go, go for it. <laughs> All right. And, he walk, and, of course, you know what happens. He walks out there. Is there not a cause? Right? And Saul tries to put his arm on him. Of course, he's not going to take that. He says, let me just go do what God wants me to do, and I'll get God to help me. He walks out there, and the, and the Philistine, of course, it, it infuriates him. It offends him to the highest degree. They'd send this little kid out here, and he looks at him, and he starts cussing him, cursing his gods. And David said, listen, pal, the Lord's going to get victory over you today. He didn't say, I'm going to get victory over you. He didn't say, you're a mean, mean old giant. I don't like you. No, he didn't say anything. He said, God's going to get victory over you today. Listen, to walk out there and to do that, that was not just out of the blue. This is just another step for David. You say, I could never do that. Right. <laughs> because we haven't been trained and we haven't shown ourselves faithful to God. And in, 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 I couldn't walk out on the field and kill a giant today. Hey, but I can do some things in my life that are kind of mind-blowing to other people because I've walked with God at that point. And the same for you. If your walk with faith has brought you to the point where you're willing to step out and do something that just seems totally crazy to everybody else, you're probably in a good place. Because that either shows that you are crazy, number one, or number two, you're really trusting God. <laughs> and only you can answer that. Come on, his brothers, what are you, what are you going out there for, David? What are you doing here? You just came out here to see what's going on. But when he walked out there, that wasn't, that wasn't just some harebrained idea. You've got to understand, God had proven himself to David so many times before then that when he came out there and he saw that Philistine giant, he said, the, the, God could take care of that guy. Nobody else want to go? Okay, Lord, let's go. <laughs> Me and you. David was not only confident, listen, I don't know, I don't, I'm going to say this, i, I got to watch how I say this. David was confident in himself, listen, listen, as long as God was with him. But his confidence went beyond himself, and he was more confident in God. And when you and I are faced with the next step of faith in our lives, I hope, I hope we can look back and see how God has helped us time after time after time after time. And when that new step needs to be taken... It ought to just be, well, God's proved himself faithful right there. Here we go, Lord, me and you. If God's proven himself faithful time and time again, why can't we prove ourselves faithful for the next step? David wasn't only confident in himself, but he was confident in God's ability. You know, we, we've studied this probably close to three months, four months now, and I think the true measure of faith in action is this. The true measure is how much confidence do you have in God? How much confidence do I have in God? Because when the Lord says, I want you to do this, and the answer is, yeah, but, then that shows that we don't have the kind of confidence we ought to have in the Lord. And the only thing that's going to fix that is going through another trial or another situation to where God can prove himself Strong in our lives so that the next time we're facing that situation, hey, God, God took care of that. He'll take care of this. All right, Lord, let's go. You know, we, we run from, boy, we run from trials, don't we? Oh, God, get me out of this. Well, the Lord might just be trying to show himself strong and mighty and faithful in your life so that the next time a big hurdle comes up, you can just hop right over that thing with the Lord's help and keep going. You don't have to sit there and mull around for two years with it. God had proven himself to David, and David now is proving himself to God. Well, the next phase of life, if you go over to 1 Samuel 24. So the big victory over Goliath, and he's brought back to the palace, and, and Saul gets jealous. <laughs> Throws a javelin at him a few times. Runs him out of town. The next phase of David's life concerning Saul, I think, is probably maybe the most noteworthy. 
As we've been preaching Sunday nights, I don't know how many years it was from 1 Samuel 17 until 2 Samuel. Um, but it was a long time. And you, you understand David's the anointed king through all of that. David knows in his mind and his heart that God has anointed him to be the next king over Israel. But he also knows that Saul was set up by God. And he had enough sense about him, praise the Lord, to not reach out his hand against God's anointed. And he always had this attitude, 1 Samuel 24. And I'm telling you, this is hard, man. This is... <laughs> Listen, if, if, if you were told you were going to be the president of, your, of a company, okay, on a job, you're working a job okay, at McDonald's, amen, but I'm like, so you're, you're working at McDonald's, and they walk in and say, hey, you've been doing a great job, we appreciate everything you've done, you serve a big back like nobody's business, so you're going to be the next store manager. Great, when's that going to happen? We'll let you know. And you keep coming to work, and you keep coming to work, and you keep coming to work, and two months, and three months, and four, and a year goes by, and you haven't been promoted to manager, what are you going to think? It ain't going to happen. Well, what do you think went through David's mind through all of those years in the wilderness, from cave to place to cave to place, and he never would kill Saul, and he never would stick out his hand against him, but he's going through the whole time. Listen, it's got to be in his head. God has anointed me king over Israel. Why is this guy still alive? Why is he still chasing me? Why am I still running for my life? But never, listen, never one time did David point his finger at God and say, you haven't done what you said you were going to do. Lord, help us. (laughs) First Samuel 24, verse 12. Here was David's attitude the whole time. This is when he could have Killed Saul, but he cut off his skirt at, at En Gedi. Says, The Lord judge between me and thee. I tell you, we, we just got to take that stance in life, folks. You know what that shows? That shows faith that God's going to do what's right in the end. And if I'm getting persecuted right now, then praise his name for it. It's, it's for my good and for his glory. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee. How about that? Romans 12 says, revenge not yourselves. It's vengeance is mine, say, Lord, I will repay. And so David just took the position, God, I'm going to let you take care of this guy. You set him up. You anointed me the next king. I'll let you take him down. And in the meantime, I'll try not to get killed. <laughs> Love you, Lord. <laughs> right? But mine hand shall not be upon thee, as saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? Now look, 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 look. Not only, not only is David having to show great patience in becoming the next king, but he also exhibits incredible humility when it comes to Saul. The guy who, who's persecuting him, who's trying to kill him. And Saul's playing the victim against David. Well, David's the one that's you know, made all this trouble in the kingdom. Remember that? Sitting under the, under the tree out there with the guys feeding him grapes, right? Remember, see, remember that? Is David going to give you a house? Right. So Saul's playing the victim. Saul's actively persecuting David. And David says, look, I'm not going to touch you. I'm going to let God judge between me and you. I'm going to let God take care of you. He says, verse, 15, verse 14, he says, After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead what? Are you kidding me? How many of us take that position with somebody that's against us? <laughs> no, nobody does. Somebody says something against us, man. He's like, let's go, let's go at it. Come on, put your dukes up, right? But David says, look, you're out, you're out here chasing a dead dog, Saul. What are you chasing me for? Or, or you know, finish, or flee. He said, Saul, I'm nothing. Why are you out here chasing me? I tell you what, if we just have an attitude with people that, that, that we think have treated us the wrong way, it'd kill all that mess. Every time. Why are you mad at me? I'm I'm nobody. The Lord therefore be judge and judge between me and thee, and see and plead my cause, and deliver me out of thine hand. What an incredible, what an incredible statement of faith in God's ability. And David said, look, 
you may chase me. It's, it's almost like this. David, in his own mind, he said, you may chase me around for another 50 years. But I know God knowing me the next king, and so God's going to take care of you. And when he does, then he can take care of me. Whew. Lord, help us. As I said, this phase characterized by patience in God, waiting on God. No bitterness in David's heart. No hatred. No guile. Toward, toward God or Saul. What an incredible thing. After God's own heart, as we said, it's not just a pursuit going after God's heart, but it's an, exhibit, an exhibition of God's characteristics of God's person. Philippians 2.20, Paul said this about Timothy. He said, he said I'm going to send Timothy to you, Philippian church. He said, because I have no other man like-minded. I think it would do us all good just to have that attitude about ourselves and say, Lord, would you help me to be like-minded with you as I deal with these people on this earth? He said, I have no other man like-minded. And, and the way he finished it was, that will naturally care for your state. For all men... Seek their own. I think David, not only was he pursuing God's heart, but he exhibited God's heart. And that's why God knew he'd be a good king. Because he was willing to let God work in him and mold him and make him into the person he was supposed to be. And God said, I I can do something with that person. But somebody whose heart is is hard and stiff and and rock solid and bless bless God, you're not going to tell me what to do. God can't do anything with that person. And if that's me, God can't do anything with me. If it's you, God can't do anything with you. But if we've got a tender heart, and we'll take some reproof, and we'll take some rebuke, and God can say, hey, you know, that, that edge right there, we just got to chop that thing off, man. I was reading in Jeremiah over there about, about the hearts of Israel. Right? And God said, he said, listen, I'm going to take care of me. He said, and I'm going to be like a hammer that breaks the rock in pieces. You know, a hard heart... <laughs> When, when the hammer of the word of God hits a hard heart, it shatters it. But when the heart is tender and moldable, and it gets in the, the hands of that potter, boy, you can just smooth that thing. It's right where it needs to be. Lord, can you use somebody like that? All the way up, I, I don't have anywhere else to turn tonight. We'll just try to hit these points and, and, and head on. David's Ascension to the throne, which we're studying right now in 2 Samuel. All of that ascension to the throne, again, exhibits his faith in God. It's his faith in action because his hand never went against the house of Saul. His hand never went against Abner. His hand never went against men that were trying to, to come in and split the kingdom and divide and, and undermine things. He always just sat right there and said, look, God's going to take care of this. God's anointed me the king. I'm going to trust God to do what he, wants, what he, what he said he's going to do. And you know, the same is going to be true for us because we've got to see this world around us just falling apart. How much faith do we have in our Lord? How much confidence do we have in our Lord that his word is going to come to pass? It's been preached for 2,000 years that Jesus is coming back. You still believe it? Yeah. But when the world around us begins to crumble, it might just get a little bit difficult to keep believing that unless we've got a strong faith, unless that faith's producing some action in our lives. But David, as he ascends to the throne, he, again, he, he never forces his way. And as we read there, well, you, you can turn over there. Go ahead, go ahead and go to 2 Samuel. Right, in verse 11 and 12, we read them there Sunday night, but verse 12, and David perceived that the Lord had established him king over Israel. Well, you, you know, listen, you know that had to be a great day in David's life. Oh, man, it finally happened. God anointed me king when I was however old, and here I am finally where God wants me, finally doing what God wants me to do. Boy, God's blessed. We've got victory over our enemies. When would you say that your faith is the strongest? In the middle of a trial or when things are going real good? (laughs) I think we'd probably have to say in the middle of a trial, our faith's a little bit stronger. Because when everything's going good, listen, it's what we're getting ready to preach in 2 Samuel. When everything's going good, our tendency is to to pull back a little bit on God and say, 
let's just coast here for a minute. And when we start coasting, things start happening that ought not be happening. Our eyes start going in different directions and our heart starts getting pulled in different directions. And David was established in verse 12 and verse 13. We're going to preach Sunday night. David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem and he starts disobeying God's word. And I'm telling you, that breach that happens right here, it, it runs and it runs under the current and it runs unseen and it runs unseen until chapter 11 with Bathsheba and it kaboom. I heard somebody put it this way. I don't know that I, I totally agree with it, but I think it's a good statement. They said this. They said, listen, you know, the Bible talks about presumptuous sin in Psalm chapter 19. That's sin that you know is wrong, but we do it anyway. They said this. They said, for, for us to commit presumptuous sin, we have to exhibit temporary atheism. Now think about that. Because I know God said it's wrong. I know God said, don't do that. And when I'm presented with the opportunity to do that, and I choose, I'm going to do that, why would I choose that? Because I don't really believe God said what he said. I, I don't know. Don't tell me, but you answer in your heart, <laughs> why, why do you do the things that God knows you shouldn't be doing? I really do. I think moment of temporary atheism. Or it's just a moment of temporary, I don't care. Or maybe it's this, I've done enough good for God today, I'm just going to get a little bit from me. I don't know what it is. But I'm telling you, when, 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 when things are going good, when things are going smooth, when times are at peace, that's what the Bible said the problem with Sodom and Gomorrah was. They were full, had idleness of time, all that, all that stuff. There was no persecution there, and so it all just ballooned into something horrible and abominable. And the same is true in my life and your life. If we're, when things are going smooth, you better praise God for it. But I'm listening, that's the time that you and I have got to keep things Tight with the Lord. You can't let your heart wander. You can't let your mind wander. You can't let your, 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 your desires wander. Your lust wander. Because that's the time that you're going to get off track if you're not careful. And instead of it being faith in action, it now becomes a lack of faith in action. And instead of it being a faith in action to please God, now it's a lack of faith in action to sin and to displease God. The early days of David's kingdom went well, but there was a breach there, there was a crack there, there was a fault there, and it manifested itself with Bathsheba. But you know what? David snapped back pretty quick there. Nathan walked in, put his finger in his face, he said, Thou art the man. And David said, I've sinned. He snapped back. But he definitely veered off track just a little bit. As we said there Sunday morning, I think I think it's it's a hard thing. It's definitely a hard thing for men to admit that they're guilty of sin. For women to admit they're guilty of sin. And that publicly. It may, maybe it's one thing to say it in our heart, Lord, I'm I'm guilty, but but to have to stand in front of other people and say, I've I've made a mistake, I'm wrong. And when Nathan put his finger in his face, this, this guy, David's the king of, he is the king of Israel. With one motion, Nathan's head would have flopped on the floor. But he looked at the man that put his finger in his face from God, and he said, yeah, you're right, I'm wrong, Lord, I'm wrong. And then you have the penning of Psalm 51. And maybe, maybe David's greatest faith in action because he's now committed adultery and murder for which there's no sacrifice in the law. And he's just got to come to God on the merit of mercy and say, God, have mercy on me. That, t- that takes a lot of faith. <laughs> probably, probably his greatest. And you know, after that, David more or less kept the course. He kept the faith. Even though God didn't take away the consequences of that sin. We'll study all that as we get through Second Samuel. The child died and... The Lord told him, look, you're going to have problems in your family from here on out. You've got Absalom's insurrection and all the problems with Joab. I mean, it's just a, it's a mess, man. It's a, it's a, what do you call it, a drama-filled mess until the end of his life. And it all swung on chapter 11. It all swung on that one sin 
where he had a momentary lapse in faith, a momentary lapse in his love for God, and his heart just wasn't right towards God that day in that situation, that season, and boy, it just ruined the rest of his, of his reign. But he kept the faith, and he stayed humble. David dreams of the end of his ministry, or the end of his reign as king. I would say despite all of the consequences of the sin, maybe we could say this, that David's back to being the same David that he was in his early years. Because he says, Lord, I want to build you a house. Lord, I want to do something for you. Lord, you're being so good to me. God, can I, can I just do this for you? And God said, no. And yet David, again, didn't point his finger at God and get mad at God. He said, okay, Lord, I'll do what I can do. <laughs> Here's all the gold and the silver and the blueprints and all these people. Look, when, when Solomon gets here, you follow Solomon. And when Solomon gets you do this for Solomon. And he got it all set up. And when he stepped off the throne, he said, Solomon, it's yours. You, you be strong, be a good courage, do what God wants you to do. Here's the plans. Here's all the materials you're going to need to build that temple. Just go do it. That's a lot of faith. I think our, our moments of faith, when we exhibit faith, mo- the moments of faith in our life are good. But listen, listen, I want, I want somebody, especially God, to be able to say, Nathan Brown had a life of faith. That it was exhibited from early childhood until he took his last breath. That's what I want. hope that's what you want. It's good to have moments of faith in action, but to have a lifetime, boy, what what an honor and a privilege that would be for my Savior. Amen. Let's pray tonight. Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for this series, Lord, how it's challenged my heart. I hope it's challenging the heart of our 